So, aside from water, change the way you think about products. How much labor does it take to make a cup of coffee? An hour? Two hours? Planting the seed? Transferring the seedling? Digging the hole? Planting the tree? Cultivating it? How much energy? How much carbon? How much greenhouse gases? New questions. It's a new future. I worked in human rights for about 15 years and spent some time in Ethiopia, Sudan, Djibouti, Somalia. Was interviewing an Ethiopian refugee about famine, why there are famines why people don't realize that famines are not made by nature, but by military governments, governments, policies, etc. And he said, you can't wake a person who's pretending to sleep. Hmm, okay. What do we need to wake up about? We can't get away from the basic math of the issue. Population, times consumption needs to equal the planet. It doesn't. We're living at 1.25 planets right now. That means we're eating our seed. We're living off the principle, not the interest. That's today. In this finite planet, should consumers have a choice about sustainability? Should you be able to buy that sustainable product or that unsustainable product on a finite planet? We don't think so. Should a company have a choice about buying raw materials that aren't sustainable? Should all products on the shelf be sustainable in a finite planet? If all products should be sustainable companies don't have choices either. If we want a sustainable planet, we need sustainability to be pre-competitive. We need companies to work together about sustainability. We need collusion. We need governments, we need civil society, we need everybody working together about sustainability. It's not a differentiator on the shelf. It's a reality we all have to live with. We need to produce more with less. 
And in fact, we've probably go back, got to go back and rehabilitate parts of the planet, regenerate parts of the planet. There's water, water everywhere. Water's embedded in everything. We can cut the amount of water in each of these products by half. We know how to do it. Better producers already do it. We're going to have to do it. Water is embedded, and we need to think about that. A lot of other things are embedded too, but today we're talking about water. So what is the current state of water? Seawater accounts for about 97.5% of the water on the planet. Fresh water, 2.5. And within the fresh water, ice is almost 70%. There's very little water that we can use. Of the water that we use, 70% is used for agriculture. 20% for industry. And 10% for domestic uses. Some rivers still look like this, but more rivers are beginning to look like this. Water hasn't flowed in this river for five years. More than a dozen major rivers on the planet don't reach the ocean. This is the present reality about water. One problem is rice. Did you know that rice uses 50% more water than all domestic use of water on the planet. We know how to produce rice with 50% less water, but we haven't started doing it yet. It is the single largest use of water by people. But in addition to water use, we also need to worry about uh, the effluence not just the take, what water we put back into the system, how polluted it is. Pristine rivers have fish that you can see when you stand near them. Polluted rivers have fish that you can see when you stand near them too. We need to care about these things. What are the biggest causes of pollution right now? Agriculture in the US, in the UK, in developing countries. Agriculture through soil erosion, through agrochemicals, is the biggest cause of water pollution on the planet. We need to begin to fix that. We know how to do it. It's not yet a priority. So what about water and people? There's about a billion people who lack access to water. There's more than two billion people that lack access to sanitary, uh, basic sanitation. By 2050, both of these figures are going to double. We live in a world where water scarcity can be mapped. We can count the number of people. We can see the impacts on the ground. This is a world pre-climate change. We know climate change is going to make water more variable. We know it's going to change. This map will become redder in some places. And year by year, it might become less red in some places. But in general, it's going to become more red. And what we've been talking about so far is what's the impact of reduced water on people. Well, these red areas aren't lived in just by people. There are a lot of other living things in these areas. Lack of water, and particularly water stress, that results from our use of resources is in fact affecting biodiversity and ecosystems all over the planet. So if you're wanting to look at what's the impact of water or what's the impact of our, some of our food production on water, what is a solution we can all live with, 
we need to look at some basic crops and products that we have and figure out what's actually going on. So let's take a t-shirt, let's take a soda, let's take a slice of cheese and a hamburger. This is how much raw material a farmer produced to make those products. This is how much water was used to make those products. Some of it's rain-fed, some of it's irrigation, some of it's a mix. This is how much the farmer was paid for the raw material that went into those products. Divide what the farmer was paid by the amount of water that it took. Is that a decent price for water? If the farmer had spent all the money they received to buy water, would that have been an adequate price for water on a finite planet? Water is external to the price of food. Water is free today. It's for the cost of pumping, and that's usually subsidized. Water is an environmental externality. We need to bring it back into the prices. If you bring water back into the prices, should food be as cheap as it is? Food needs to be more expensive to cover the cost of producing food. And I don't just mean the labor cost and the capital cost and the investment cost, I mean the water cost, the soil cost, the biodiversity and habitat cost of producing food. And yet, one billion people don't have enough food. And I would also add half a billion, uh, or rather half of the farmers, mostly small farmers, can't feed themselves we have a basic problem. We need to figure out how to solve it. We've been talking about what is. This is what will be. By 2050, we're going to have 3 billion more people. They're going to consume 2.9 time, times as much stuff. In developing countries, it's going to be closer to 5 times as much stuff. Consumption globally is going to double per capita, of food is going to double, and 70% of the people are going to live in cities. That's as many people as are on the planet today. Those people are not going to be producing most of the calories that they eat. They're going to be dependent on others for those. Where is the food going to come from? Well, I think that one of the ways that we could start thinking about this is urban agriculture. I was in Michigan yesterday, and there's a lot of talk in Michigan about urban agriculture. There's a lot of talk about what you do with 40,000 acres of urban land that is abandoned now because there's no industry in Detroit. Detroit is a manufacturer of energy. A lot of it's coal. The U.S. Half the water that we use in the U.S. is to cool thermal power plants. Half of the water. That means the water becomes hot. What can we do with hot water? We can grow food with it. We can grow vertical food in cities. We can do hydroponics. If we can figure out how to turn Detroit into producing nutrition, green vegetables, leafy vegetables, fresh vegetables, year-round because we have hot water coming off of thermal plants, maybe that could become a model for other parts of the world, other cities as well, because we've got to figure out a way to feed people in cities in the future. We can argue a lot about what impacts are going to be accept are acceptable today with 6.7 billion people. But no matter what conclusions we come to today about those, what impacts are acceptable, we know that when you have 9 billion, that same level of impacts is not going to be acceptable anymore. We're going to have to be improving constantly. We can't even agree today about what the impacts are that are appropriate on the planet. We've got to stop trying to look at our problems as food, as 
gender, as agriculture, as water, etc. The more we try to maximize any one thing, the less we're going to optimize several things. And we need to be working on things simultaneously, not individually. So what do you see here? A can, an aluminum can, a 12 ounce can to be precise. A can that in most cases is worth more than what's in it. The company pays more for this material than what is in it. How much water do you think it takes to make this can? If it comes from Brazil, if it comes from hydroelectric energy created in the Tucuruí Dam, then it takes 660 liters of water going over the dam through the turbines to create the energy to make this one product. Water over the dam, right? No big deal. Water above, water below. But in the tropics, when you have to build the dam in a flat area, you have to have a huge basin. And because you have a huge basin in a high temperature area, you have a lot of evapotranspiration. So you have a lot of, of water going up into the air. The downstream river flow from this dam is 83% less than it used to be. That's an impact. But it isn't just about water. How much rainforest do you think it took to make this can? One can. Half an inch. Half an inch of rainforest for every single can that was made from the aluminum that came from this mine and this hydroelectric dam. Take it to a laptop. How much do you think it took to make the average laptop that's half aluminum by weight? Three and a half square feet of rainforest. How much greenhouse gases? How much energy? How many other things did it take? How many times do we need to use this material to make that sacrifice worthwhile? Once, twice, eight, 10, 20? Half of the cans in the US are thrown away every year. They're not recycled. And the rate's going down. We need to begin to use less to produce more and to recycle. When we recycle cans like this, we save 95% of the energy of virgin aluminum. We save the water, we save the greenhouse gas, etc. There's simply no excuse for not doing it. If you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. Where are we, where are we going? We're going to 2050. We're going to have three billion more people. Their need in many parts of the world to consume more and in some parts of the world to consume less. How are we gonna get there? There's something that each of us can do. There's a path that each of us can do. Thank you very much.